Thank you. I have to admit that my French is not up for this task, so we'll switch languages if you permit me. My name is Anastina Hinza. I'm the CEO of Hinza Performance and uh, very glad to be here, I have to say. I had an interesting, actually two interesting discussions today where I told the person where I was coming and they looked at me kind of perplexed. What on earth does well-being and human high performance have to do with digital? Admittedly, a good question. My question is, our lives are changing. Our work is changing. What can we do to make sure that we thrive, not just survive, in that new world? Oftentimes when we talk about digital, and I know that's been the case for today as well, we focus on blockchain, 5G, AI, IoT, the productivity, the financial, the efficiency, advanced analytics, automation. All good stuff, by the way. But we often forget that in the middle of that all, there's a human being who needs to operate it, who needs to manage it, who needs to cope with the change. I'm going to start off with a few facts. About 80% check their smartphone within 15 minutes of waking up. I claim that's more like five minutes or 15 seconds. How many of you admit to this one? Hands up. I can't really see, but I'm not seeing 42%. We check in on our devices every six minutes. And by the way, even just having your cell phone next to you turned on has a negative impact on your cognitive performance. Our work is interrupted every 11 minutes. It's the ping on your email, the call, that notification, or then just that thought, the thing that you were supposed to do when you get back from work. And when you do get back from work, what do you do? You want to sit back and relax, maybe watch some TV. What you end up doing is switching between your TV, your laptop, your iPad, and your cell phone an average 21 times per hour. We're unable to focus, and that is a problem. At Hinsa, our mission is to help people live better lives and consequently perform better. Our story actually begins here. The company was originally founded by my father about 20 years ago, in, um, and the philosophy he created was based on what he learned in Ethiopia, where we lived as a family in the 1990s. My father got to work with poor communities. He was an orthopedic surgeon, but he also got to very closely uh, work with some elite athletes, uh, long-distance runners, including a runner called Haile Gebre Selassie, which some of you might recognize. My father got to work closely with Haile, watching him train, prepare for races, win a lot of races, but also face some setbacks. Around the Athens Olympics, Haile was having problems with his Achilles tendon, and it turned out he had to be operated. So he flew to Finland to be operated by my father and his team. I rarely saw my father nervous, but that's a pretty high-stakes Achilles tendon. Haile noticed this, and what he told my father stuck with him for a long time. He said, Doctor, don't worry. It's just running. If you pause there for just a second. One of the best, undoubtedly, one of the best long-distance runners of all time, about to get on the operating table, tells the operating surgeon, Doctor, chill out. It's just running. It's pretty impressive. Running was Hylas' passion. It's what he was good at. But at the same time, it was not his whole life. His identity was not, quote unquote, just a runner. It was much more. It was based on values such as giving back to his community, being there for his family, and being a businessman, as a matter of fact. 
what my father learned from Haile, and in particular his resilience at the face of setbacks and challenges, inspired him to dig deeper into human high performance. He created a model, which he then adapted in other sports, most notably in Formula One, uh, where we've been working for the past 20 years with pretty good results. And in Finland, where we come from, we would say this is an okay result. In the past 20 years, we've won 14 world championships and 96% of podium places in the last five seasons. So we've learned something in sport. However, most of our clients today come from business. And the question they ask us is, how can I maximize my performance while living this healthy, happy, balanced life? How many of you have ever asked that question? Yeah, me too. What my father would tell you is that that's the wrong question to ask. Optimize, don't maximize. A lot of times, especially now, especially with all this new connectedness, we get stuck in a way, unconsciously or consciously, whereby we try and maximize every single area of our lives. We have demanding jobs, and yes, our work is changing. We go back home, and we want to be the parents and the partners and the friends and the people that our families and loved ones deserve. In our free time, we do triathlons. I've noticed a lot of people do that here in Switzerland. Uh, we run marathons. We do ultra marathons or CrossFit. Uh, we study Japanese or Chinese or Python. We, you know, attend all these fancy conferences and build our personal brand on LinkedIn. It doesn't take an expert to tell you that combining all that, it's an unsustainable way of living. I actually know this also from personal experience. About seven years ago, my world went black. I was working at a global management consultancy at the time, and uh, you know, one could say I was maybe not living the healthiest of lives. I was running down the stairs to catch a taxi one Monday morning when I fainted. Rolled down the staircase, woke up at the bottom of it. Um, my head was actually bleeding. And my first reaction, oh my god, where's my laptop? Realized I needed some help. I loved my job. I really enjoyed it. But at the same time, I was sacrificing, compromising things such as sleep, an average 4.3 hours at my worst nights, compromising things such as nutrition, I was living out of hotel minibars most of the time. I used to run marathons. Now I was running from one airport terminal to another, which in Frankfurt is a pretty good exercise, but otherwise it doesn't really count as much. Something had to change. This is me nine months after my burnout. I'm running in a desert with 12 kilos on my back and 250 kilometers to go. It was my first ultramarathon, which I finished. But even more astonishingly for me, I was back at work with the same employer, working full time. And I was really, really happy. So what changed? I did call my father, and he introduced me to this. It's a model that we call the circle of better life. It's a holistic model of human health and performance. It's got six elements on the outer circle, all linked together. Physical activity, nutrition, sleep and recovery, biomechanics, mental energy, and finally, general health. All those elements are interconnected, influencing each other. And finally, in the middle of that all, there is the core. Core is basically the question of what are you optimizing for? My father actually summarized it in three. Do you know who you are? Do you know what you want? And are you in control of your life? 
what are the things that are really important to you? Who are the people that are really important to you? Are you spending your time and your energy in accordance to your values? You're working really, really hard, but have you asked yourself the question, why? And the final question around control is a tricky one. A lot of the people that I speak to, and myself included, uh, we end up in a situation where, where we feel like we're no longer in the driver's seat of our own lives. We're just reacting to things as they come along. I returned to work with a different agenda. I was reminded of the things that really mattered to me, of the things I wanted to achieve in the long run, and of the things I wasn't willing to compromise anymore. I learned from my ultra marathons that you know, work life is it's not a sprint. It's not even a marathon, it's an ultra. And in order to get to the end, you need to optimize, not maximize. It's well-being is not something you maintain on the side. It's the foundation for a sustainable high performance. In sport, we have known this actually for quite some time. Uh, we talk about super compensation. I don't know if have any of you heard of the term before? Maybe, maybe not. Basically what it means is that when we exercise, we break some muscle tissue. And when we rest, we'll build muscle. If you, and we end up at a level that's higher than the level where we started, which is called supercompensation. If we skip on the rest, the trend is negative. The same applies to our brains. Our brains develop in rest. When resting, we consolidate memories. We come up with these insights. All of the skills that we require, in particular, in this new world of work, in this future of work, creativity, complex problem solving, collaboration, ability to connect with other people, emotional intelligence, these are all skills and outputs of a rested and focused brain. And I dare to claim that our current lifestyle doesn't really support that. And I actually have some facts to back that out for you guys too. Some of you, 58 of you, actually filled out a survey before coming here today um, about the circle of better life. And uh, I got the results up here. This is the average scores. I don't know if you can see them very well, but your average was pretty much in line with what we see elsewhere as well. And uh, I think the best way to summarize is that there is room for improvement. Across that circle, across those foundations of mental and physical health and well-being and performance, we see that we have room for improvement, in particular in areas such as physical activity and sleep and recovery. General health is OK, but it's a lagging indicator. I would be worried if that was really low. Average are never the full story, right? When we compared the participant data here to our benchmark, uh, which in this case was about 6,400, we could see some interesting distributions. The physical activity, which was the lowest score, remains the lowest, and there is actually a higher number of people who did nothing. And uh, if we look at sleep and recovery, though, it's quite interesting. Actually, even though the score is relatively low, we see that the distribution is somewhat better than in the benchmark, so well done. If we dig even deeper into the data, what we find out is that 22% of the respondents to this survey did not achieve the WHO, World Health Organization, recommendations for physical activity. A minimum of 150 minutes per week. 15% of the respondents were eating six portions of vegetables per day or more. The recommendation is even more than eight. Interestingly, two-thirds of you who replied claimed that you were eating very healthy. Almost 60% were getting less than seven hours of sleep per night. And from science, what we know is that sleep depth is unfortunately cumulative. If you sleep for six hours per night for two weeks in a row, your performance declines equivalent to staying up for two nights in a row. Let me repeat that. 
if you're sleeping for six hours per night consecutively, you're probably performing equivalent to if you had stayed up for two nights in a row. You just don't realize it. Health and well-being is about identifying the elements where you have the biggest gaps and the biggest drivers that will have an impact. It's about small things done consistently well. That being said, progress is never linear. Only about 8% eight eight of the people actually achieve their New Year's resolutions. This is a good time to be reminded about that. And the most often cited reason, life happens. In Hinsa, we talk about four modes. We have a normal mode, which is your long-term sustainable way of living. But sometimes we're on a mission. Mission mode means a tight deadline, a project, a transformation that you're, a digital transformation that you're leading. It's a small baby at home. It's when you're not getting enough sleep. It's when you're not able to maybe perform the way you would ideally do. It's about identifying the minimum level that you're not willing to compromise and then implementing life hacks, what we call, to survive. If you don't get the eight hours of night, maybe take a nap. The important thing is to remember that your mission mode is not your normal mode, and it should be always followed by recovery. And then finally, renewal. Renewal is when we take a step back when we think about where we are in life, and when we think about the things, the trajectory that we're taking. Are we going upwards? Or is our trajectory negative? Do we need to adjust course? The good news is, it's not just about self-control. In fact, research says that the individuals who seem to have the best self-control actually deployed the least. Instead, what they do is they create an environment to support positive habits, support the good decisions, and make the hard, bad decisions a little bit harder to do. There is, I want to finish off with making this a little bit more concrete. There is actually a um, device that we use, which is called WHOOP. It consists of a wish, outcome, obstacle, and plan. It's a simple tool to make behavior change into action. What I would like you to do, each one of you, and I assume many of you have thought about this as it is January, is think of a wish, one thing that you would like to achieve. For me personally, back then and still, it is about sleep. What I wish to achieve is eight hours of sleep tonight. Make it concrete. Make it something that you can actually do in the next 48 hours. What do you wish? Everyone got that? One thing, one small thing that you would like to change. Now think about the outcome. How do you feel when you have achieved that goal? Research suggests that when we link our wishes into a feeling, to an emotion, we're more likely to achieve them. How do you feel and maybe even close your eyes for just a second. How do you feel when you've achieved that goal? For me, it's when I sleep well, I'm rested, I think straight, and I'm just generally a little bit of a nicer person. Then you think about the obstacle. What prevents you from achieving that goal? What stands in your way? I told you about my poor night's sleep when I was a consultant. I would like you to believe it was my work. Well, I was getting stuck on a computer when I was supposed to go to bed. Mm, it used to be social media back then. Nowadays, Netflix. There is that horrible feature in Netflix where you, you, know, you watch an episode and then when you're fin finishing it, there's that little thing in the right-hand corner which is like next episode playing in three, two, one. And then suddenly, instead of watching one, you end up watching three and you lost three, nights, three hours of sleep. The final thing is, what can you do to modify your environment to support actually achieving that goal? My big newsflash was there is 
a way to turn off Netflix autoplay. You need to do it through the browser. It's very complicated. They made it complicated, but you can do it. Also, you can uh, you know, delete the distracting apps like Facebook and Instagrams. And uh, if you're like me, you can encrypt your passwords to make it even harder to do. What can you do about your environment at home or at your workplace to make the good decisions a little bit easier and the bad decisions a little bit harder to do? Because sustainable performance is about doing small things consistently well. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. Unfortunately, time is over, but maybe just a little question, because uh, uh, many here in the audience uh, are probably uh, very busy and, and stressful. What is the most important recommendation for, for us? I'm going to just say, even though your recovery uh, scores were relatively high, um, typically that tends to be one of the biggest issues. So. Sleep and three things about sleep: <laughs> quantity, consistency, and quality. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you Anastina. Thanks. Insta, merci.